the social trinity is heresy. And yes, you heard me correctly, heresy. The range of reactions at this point are from what in the hell is social trinitarianism to how dare you denounce my position to a resounding amen from all of the classical orthodox trinitarians in the back. Most Christians, unfortunately, are clueless that there are even differing views of the Trinity. And quite frankly, the majority of Christians aren't even sure what they believe concerning the Trinity. I'm going to attempt to remedy that in this short video. Now, what are the differing views of the Trinity? The first position is undoubtedly the biblical view of the Trinity, and of course, it's what I believe. It's properly known as the classical orthodox Trinity. The term classical denotes that it is the view Bible-believing Christians have adhered to historically. That should be a sign. Again, it's the classical view, meaning the traditional view of the Christian church for two millennia. It's called the classical orthodox Trinity at that. The reason is because it's the biblical teaching of the Trinity. Orthodox literally means right doctrine or sound doctrine. And as you'll see in just a moment, it's apparent that this is the right biblical teaching on the Trinity. Now, to underscore or emphasize this point a little more, when I say that this is the position Christians have held for 2,000 years, what I mean is that every Christian writing up until and through the Reformation was representing and propounding the classical Orthodox Trinity, categorically and without exception. The classical Orthodox Trinity teaches that there is one God who is Trinity. The one God Almighty, creator of all things seen and unseen, is one in being or essence and three in person. This is the language that we've all heard many times. One God in being and three in person. This isn't random. It's the historical language that has been used by the Christian church. But unfortunately, we've lost the definitions and the meanings of those definitions of the confession of our faith. What do we mean when we say God is one in being and three in person? First, God as one in being simply means that there is only one God. There isn't more than one being that is God. This is monotheism 101. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Bible teaches that there is only one God. This one God is referred to as He, and furthermore, He speaks of Himself as one being. For example, Deuteronomy 32 verse 40, Jehovah says, For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. In Scripture, when God reveals Himself to us, we see the Bible speaking of the mind singular of the Lord and the will singular of God. Every Christian intuitively knows that it would be blasphemous to talk about the minds of God or the wills of the Lord. Simply put, because there is only one God, he is one in being and therefore possesses a single mind and a single will. So nonetheless, while God is one in being, we mustn't forget that he is three in persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or also stated as Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. Persons is a term adopted by the Christian church to express the Bible's glorious revelation of the three subsistences of the one being that is God. They are not three beings, but rather three persons of the one being. God is triune in his very nature. However, the creator is not the creature. A frequent mistake made is when we bring God down to our level, level in order to understand him better. When in reality, the God of scripture is the everlasting I am. He fills all things and at the very same time transcends all things. God is spirit, the Bible teaches. The term persons was used to describe Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but does not suggest that there are three beings Three beings that somehow possess each their own independent minds, wills, etc. This is why in Scripture the three persons of the Trinity are described as being inseparable. That is, God is one in being. God is one being. God the Father created the world through his word or his son. His son that eternally proceeds forth from him as the very arm of the Lord. The power of the word is the Holy Ghost, which also proceeds forth eternally from both father and son. The greatest analogy is the son. The core of the son would be the father. He's the source of all things. Jesus then is the brightness of the son and the Holy Spirit is the warmth. This is, in fact, an analogy Scripture uses in Hebrews 1. God is truly one being existing in three persons, and because of this, God works as Trinity. This is what is known as the inseparable operations of God. He works as Trinity because he is Trinity. The error, however, people sometimes make 
is projecting the idea of a human person onto the divine persons of the Trinity. They pull God down in an attempt to understand him better. This is not what persons has meant historically. And this is where the social Trinitarian gets himself into heresy. The social Trinity is, again, a minority and modern view of the Trinity held by liberal scholars. The root of the problem is to redefine the term persons and make three persons out to be human persons, which in turn, by definition, makes them out to be three distinct beings and three distinct gods. However, when it comes to God, we know that there is only one being, according to fundamental Christian theology. The social trinity propagates that the persons of the trinity possess distinct minds, wills, emotions, experiences, and consequently with that, seats of consciousness. This view of the trinity, although it isn't very common, is very dangerous. As a matter of fact, the social trinity is heresy. If the defining attribute of being is mind and will, God possesses a singular mind, singular will of God. And then the social trinity comes along and they assign to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost a mind and will and emotions, all of the properties of what makes God one in the first place. Your result would be three beings, three beings who each are God and therefore polytheism. Hence, social trinitarianism is heresy.